I have the pleasure of kicking off this afternoon with Zora Neale Hurston, who looms large in the popular imagination now. Her writing is a staple of high school and university curricula. Her words, her likeness, even her personal style are iconic. You may also know another part of Hurston's story, that it was not always this way. Though Hurston was celebrated in her own lifetime, she died in relative obscurity and was buried in an unmarked grave. In 1975, the writer Alice Walker sought out her grave, placed a headstone in the cemetery where she was buried, and published the essay In Search of Zora Neale Hurston, which is also called Looking for Zora, helping to bring Hurston back to life. A question I like to ask about Zora Neale Hurston is how do we look for her? How can we know her? What can we know about her? Hurston left behind a partial and fragmentary archive with nothing like the volume of some of her contemporaries' papers. Yale was the first repository to receive portions of Hurston's archive. Here at the Beinecke in the James Weldon Johnson Memorial Collection, the small Zora Neale Hurston collection includes manuscript and typescript drafts of four major works, Their Eyes Were Watching God, Tell My Horse, Dust Tracks on a Road, and Moses, Man of the Mountain, and a few shorter works all donated by Hurston. And can we go to the next slide? The title page of Hurston's manuscript for Dust Tracks on a Road, her autobiography, um, which is right there, includes the transcription to the James Weldon Johnson Memorial Collection of Negro Arts and Letters at Yale University through the efforts of Carl Van Vechten to enrich it, Zora Neale Hurston. And below that, she notes that several chapters included in this manuscript draft were cut by the publishers. These were published when Hurston's writings were added to the Library of America in 1995. Unlike someone like Langston Hughes, who formed a lasting relationship with Yale as a repository for his papers, Hurston did not add to the few manuscripts she initially donated. When she died indigent in Fort Pierce, Florida in 1960, her personal possessions at that time became the property of the state of Florida. The papers from inside her home were collected in a barrel in the yard to be burned. After being set aflame, the papers were saved by the intervention of Patrick Duval, a deputy sheriff and friend of Hurston's. Thanks to Duval and other friends, the papers were eventually donated to the University of Florida libraries, which had been Hurston's wish. This portion of Hurston's archive, which at 16 boxes is significantly larger than the group given to Yale, remains relatively small. It includes letters from her later life and manuscripts relating to her last unpublished book project, a biography of Herod the Great. So much of Hurston's life and work remains scantily documented. Knowing what we know about her life, we might wonder where it all went. What happened to her incoming correspondence? What about the field notes from her research? Did she keep any diaries? Drafts of her projects, including projects known to have been in progress at the time of her death? Where did all of this material go? I should be clear that it didn't all burn. Uh, judging by accounts I've seen, most of the papers in Florida were saved. Um, perhaps the ever itinerant Hurston simply saved very little. Always on the move and little able to afford storage space, it's possible that she discarded a great deal. Though the archives of her own papers is sparse, Hurston survives in the hundreds of extant letters from her that reside in the papers of the letters recipients. Many of these were collected in a remarkable volume edited by Carla Kaplan. Several dozen Hurston letters can be found in the James Weldon Johnson Memorial Collection in the papers of Langston Hughes, <coughs> excuse me, Langston Hughes, Carl Van Vechten, Walter White, James Weldon Johnson, and Grace Mock Johnson. So if you're looking for Zora, I recommend looking in those collections. And what will you find? Do these letters give us a look at the real Zora? By way of an answer, I'll close with just a few words of hers from a March 1928 letter to Langston Hughes. Most gorgeous possibilities are showing themselves constantly. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nancy Cool, and I'm delighted to talk with you today about Marian Anderson to begin with, um, and later somebody else, also exciting. <laughs> Among the most beloved classical singers of the 20th century, Marian Anderson was raised in Philadelphia. She joined her church's junior choir at the age of six and sought out musical training and opportunities to perform throughout her childhood. Her family couldn't afford musical instruction, so her church raised money to send Anderson for singing lessons and to a city high school. After graduating in 1921, 
She hoped to study at the Philadelphia Music Academy, but the school would not accept an African-American student. In 1925, Anderson won a singing contest in New York. Her prize was the opportunity to perform with the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. The show was a success and the music world took notice. Anderson began performing more widely, playing Carnegie Hall for the first time uh, in 1928, and the next year she was awarded a fellowship to study in Berlin. Soon she was touring across Europe and her concerts were broadcast on the radio around the world. When Marian Anderson returned to the US, she faced challenges she had not encountered in Europe. The so-called Jim Crow laws enforcing racial segregation made traveling extremely difficult. In her memoir, Anderson wrote of singing a sold out concert at a prestigious hall and then afterwards going to a diner with her white pianist and waiting outside while he went in to get their meals because the restaurant wouldn't serve her. In 1939, Anderson tried to secure Constitution Hall in Washington DC for a concert. It was the largest performance space in the city. The venue was operated by the National Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution, the DAR, and they refused to allow African-Americans to perform in the hall, no matter that Marian Anderson was by then a household name and universally considered to be one of the greatest singers in the world. The first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, happened to be a member of the DAR. Outraged by their racism, Roosevelt resigned from the organization. A request was made to organize a concert instead at the Lincoln Memorial and President Franklin Delano Roosevelt approved. What happened next is legendary. Michael, will you change the slide? Thank you. On April 9th, 1939, Easter Sunday, Marian Anderson performed on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial for an unprecedented crowd of 75,000 people. Millions more tuned in on the radio. Anderson was introduced by the Secretary of the Interior, Harold Eckes, whose remarks began, quote, in this great auditorium under the sky, all of us are free. Anderson began the concert with the patriotic song, My Country Tis of Thee, a song then considered to be an unofficial, unofficial national anthem. And in acknowledgement of the enormous assembled crowd, Anderson pluralized the lyrics of the first verse, singing, of thee we sing. Marian Anderson's career unfolded for several more decades, and she finally retired from the stage only in the 1960s. By the time of her death in 1993, she had received just about every honor imaginable, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the National Medal of the Arts, and the Congressional Gold Medal. Still, that Easter Sunday concert in 1939 was certainly among the most important performances of her life. Later, about the racist policy that prevented her from performing at Constitution Hall, Anderson said, quote, I forgave the DAR many years ago. You lose a lot of time hating people. By all accounts, Anderson wasn't the sort of person who sought out opportunities to make bold political statements, but she knew well the influence she might have. She said, quote, the minute a person whose word means a great deal to others dares to take the open-hearted and courageous way, many others follow. Thank you. Hello everyone, I have the pleasure of talking about Mary McLeod Bethune. She became known as one of the most important black educators, uh, civil and women's rights leaders and government officials of the 20th century. And the college she founded, Bethune Cookman University set educational standards for today's black colleges. Her accolades influenced so many people that we have come to admire her today, such as, um, well, most of the people that you see on the vinyls that we're looking at. Um, and I figured, uh, why not talk about one of the most well-known examples, uh, Langston Hughes. So McLeod was actually one of Hughes's first professional mentors, when you think about it. Um, Michael, can you go to the next slide for me, please? Thank you. So uh, with the help of Michael, we actually digged up something called Hughes's Top 12 Negro Poems that you see there. And one of them being by Margaret Walker, the great Margaret Walker for Mary McLeod Bethune. And I'll just read this very quickly before we move forward. Great Amazon of God, behold your bread, wash home again from many distant seas. The cup of life you lift contains no leaves, no bitterness to mock you in its steed. So many gone this brimming chalice fed and brokenhearted people on their knees. 
look up to you and suddenly they seize on living faith and they are comforted, believing in the people who are free, who walk uplifted and honest way. You look at last upon another day that you have fought with God and man to see. Great Amazon of God, behold your bread. We walk with you and we are comforted. Now from that alone, the imagery used in this poem perfectly describes how wholesome, comforting, reliable of a woman uh, Bethune was. And the Van Vecten photo perfectly sort of matches that. Strong, those strong adjectives that are used. I could only imagine how strongly Hughes felt after him reading this because of his personal relationship uh, with her. So taking it back to the early 1930s, Bethune helped to arrange a reading of um, Langston Hughes, a, a reading tour, should I say, of Langston Hughes. The tour would take uh, Hughes to many Black colleges and universities throughout the South. And in Langston Hughes's autobiography, I Wonder As I Wander, he really goes into detail about his relationship, one of his first encounters with Bethune. And I'm going to read a little bit of it just to give you guys an idea of their relationship of how, and also of how that poem there really speaks to her personality. Um, he starts with, um, he travels to Bethune-Cookman College in 1931, accompanied by his friend, Zell Ingram, and he says this, we stopped at Daytona Beach to visit Bethune-Cookman College, of which that most distinguished of Negro women, Mary McLeod Bethune was president. We reached Daytona about eight o'clock in the evening. It took us some time to find the campus. When we did, we stopped before the last building where we saw lights burning. It was warm, so the doors and windows were all open. We heard a group of girls singing in the second floor room. Zell went upstairs to inquire the way to Mrs. Bethune's home. As a teacher answered his knock on the classroom door, I hear the singing stop. Then I hear a woman's voice exclaim, no more class tonight, girls. The poet, Langston Hughes, is here. Uh, he, he talks a little bit about his reaction and says, I was struck dumb with shyness. I had no idea my name would be known in Florida other than to Miss Bethune herself, whom I had once met at Columbia University. And he talks about how gracious she was, her hospitality, how motherly and kind and wise she was. And he says, the next day, I read some of my poems to the English classes on her campus. That was the beginning of my learning how to make a living from writing. For it was Mrs. Bethune who said to me the night before, why don't you tour the South reading your poems? Thousands of Negro students would be proud and inspired by seeing you and hearing you. You are young, but you have already made a name for yourself in literary circles. And you can help black students to feel that Negro youth can amount to something in this world, in spite of our problems. That is so powerful every time I read that part, just to think, if you think that they had never met, where would Hughes be? How would we think of Hughes moving forward? And though they were different in age, family background and, you know, sort of general environment, Hughes and Bethune were like, they were alike in their courageous perseverance and personal and racial trials and their keen perception of human nature and their lifelong dedication to improving a lot of the fellow Afro-Americans. So that alone, as we admire Hughes so much, that was because of Bethune. And that's very powerful. Thank you, Michael. County Cullen was a poet, novelist, dramatist, and in his later years, a school teacher. The Beinecke Library holds a small but significant collection of his work, including notebooks, drafts, proofs, and or typescripts of some of his major works, such as The Black Christ and Copper Sun. Today, as some of you would know, is National Letter Writing Day, so I will focus my brief remarks on the correspondence in the County Cullen collection. 
He was born County Leroy Porter and was brought to New York by his paternal grandmother at the age of nine. Cullen was raised from the age of 15, perhaps legally adopted. It's not clear whether it was a legal adoption, but was adopted in, in spirit, if not in law, by the Reverend F.A. Cullen and his wife. The Reverend Mr. Cullen was pastor of the Salem Methodist Episcopal Church, one of Harlem's most prominent churches. And the Reverend Mr. Cullen was also president of the Harlem branch of the NAACP. Last episode, on these photographs, Melissa shared some insights about Harold Jackman, who, as she noted, was best friends with County Cullen in New York, uh, fellow students at both DeWitt Clinton High School and at New York University. And as Melissa noted in her remarks, Jackman was best man at Cullen's wedding to Yolande Du Bois, only daughter of Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, the extraordinary national and international leader. Jackman gave the James Weldon Johnson Memorial Collection a set of 23 letters from Cullen to himself, to Jackman, such as this letter that you see from August 10th, 1923, where Cullen writes, I have just returned from paying my first call on Yolande Du Bois, who is stopping a stone's throw from my house. She pleases one without any reservations. No, she is not beautiful, but one is drawn to her by some indefinable magnetism of refinement and soulful honesty. So that's Cullen writing to Jackman. And in fact, uh, Jackman was the one who uh, arranged uh, the meeting and, and sort of brought Du Bois, Yolande Du Bois and County Cullen together. The letters from Cullen to Jackman, which span 1923 to 1945, near the end of Cullen's brief life, are really intimate, oftentimes chatty, sometimes deep, sometimes full of gossip, oftentimes both, and they're quite compelling. The Cullen Du Bois wedding in 1928 was itself quite compelling. It was the social event of its time in Harlem and was covered widely in the black press, not only in New York, but nationally. It's said that while 1,200 people were invited, 3,000 crowded into the Salem church, the Reverend Mr. Cullen's church, for the ceremony on April 8, 1928. Well, the marriage was as brief as the wedding was spectacular. For as Melissa noted last week, Colin left for Paris shortly, just a few months after the wedding, not with Yolande Du Bois, but with Harold Jackman, a fact that generated the memorable newspaper headline, quote, groom sales with best man. Yolande had expressed concerns privately to her father, Dr. Du Bois, early in the marriage about how the marriage was going, or rather, not going. And she and Cullen would divorce on January 29, 1930, less than two years after they married. Interestingly enough, a divorce that was negotiated between County Cullen and Dr. Du Bois without Yolande Du Bois' involvement very much, just as the wedding had been planned by Dr. Du Bois and, w, uh, and County Cullen without too much of Yolande Du Bois' involvement. The Mining and Library holds letters from Yolande Du Bois to County Cullen. You see the folders here. There are these extraordinary set of letters from 1923 to 1929, as I note, 415 total images. The entire run of correspondence by Yolande Du Bois to County Cullen and by County Cullen to Harold Jackman, Jackman in the Beinecke Library are completely digitized and available to you anytime online. Yolande Du Bois' letters to Cullen are an extraordinary and interesting trove on their own. Like Cullen's letters to Jackman, her correspondence uh, are completely digitized, as I noted. As you can imagine, 
and I hope you will not only imagine, but look for yourself. There are many lines to read in these letters and much, much to read between the lines. So uh, not to have any biases, but um, this is kind of a favorite of mine. Um, so I was happy to be assigned to this one. Uh, Ella Fitzgerald, one of the single most influential American singers of the 20th century. Through the course of her long career, she made hundreds of recordings and won no less than 14 Grammy Awards. Um, she was born in Virginia. Her family moved to New York when she was a child. And it was there that she began her career at a very young age. In 1935, when she was only 16, Fitzgerald won a talent contest at Harlem's famous Apollo Theater. Uh, she gained the attention of New York jazz musicians in the audience, including Chick Webb, who was a very famous band leader. He invited her to audition with his band, uh, band afterwards, and they played a show in New Haven, actually, New Haven, Connecticut. She sang with Webb's band as a feature singer for many years. I believe he died in the late 1940s or early 1940s, and she took over as band leader only a few years later. I believe she was only 20, 20-ish 20 years old, which is amazing. And after years of performing and recording, she made her famous songbook recordings, including, uh, Michael, you can go to the next slide there, including A Ticket, A Tasket, which you see right here, which we have digitized in the library. And those albums remain among the most influential popular records in American music, accompanied by the best orchestras, musicians, and singers of that period. And what I personally love about Fitzgerald, and unfortunately we won't be able to play any songs because we will be putting this on YouTube and want to avoid copyright issues. But the thing that was so great about Fitzgerald was she was very known for her clarity, the clarity of her voice and her perfect pitch. So, you know, according to many, it was that perfect pitch that really helped her perform that scat sort of singing that she became very famous for. I'm actually currently, every year I listen to her Christmas album, uh, Ella Wishes You a Swinging Christmas. And that in that album, she does a lot of her, you know, famous scatting and re, you know, covers a bunch of very famous Christmas songs. And it's very great. I advise you guys go listen to that <laughs> this month. Um, and you know, often called the first lady of song, Fitzgerald performed and recorded with the finest jazz performers of all time, including Benny Goodman, Count Basie, Dizzy Gillespie, and Teddy Wilson, a lot more. She was the recipient of many awards, like I said, honorary degrees and the National Medal of Arts. And uh, Ella Fitzgerald School of the Performing Arts at the University of Maryland was named in honor of her tremendous contributions to American popular music. Thank you, Michael. I'm delighted to talk to you about Paul Robeson too today. Um, uh, today, many remember Paul Robeson as an extraordinary singer and actor, and this is an accurate description, but he was also a lawyer, an NFL football player, and a committed advocate for civil rights in the United States. Robeson grew up in Princeton, and he was still a teenager when his many talents started to come into public view. He had an academic scholarship to Rutgers, where he was an outstanding football player, twice All-American, and his class valedictorian. After graduating, Robeson went on to Columbia Law School. He was still a student there in 1921 when he made his Broadway debut. Shortly after that, he was recruited to play pro football, and he took a leave of absence from law school to play with the Milwaukee Badgers for a year. Then he returned to Columbia to complete his law degree and pass the bar exam. In the years that followed, Robeson became a worldwide sensation for his roles in The Emperor Jones, Showboat, and many other plays, and for his exceptional singing voice. 
Robeson also became an outspoken advocate for civil rights. In the late 1930s, he said, quote, the artist must take sides. He must elect to fight for freedom or slavery. I have made my choice. I had no alternative. Robeson used his enormous fame to fight injustice, and eventually this cost him a great deal. In the McCarthy era, he was blacklisted and prevented from performing. His US passport was revoked in 1950, making it impossible for him to tour overseas for nearly a decade. When he was called before the House Committee on Un-American Activities and asked why, in light of his sympathy for the political philosophy of the Soviet Union, he did not choose to live there, Robeson responded, quote, because my father was a slave and my people died to build this country, I'm going to stay here and have a part of it just like you and no fascist minded people will drive me from it. There is much more to say about Paul Robeson, but to conclude, I wanna share a story I heard from his son, Paul Robeson Jr. when he visited the Beinecke Library in 2003 to consult his mother's writings in the James Weldon Johnson Memorial Collection. As an aside, Islanda Robeson, wife of Paul and mother of Paul Jr., was also an extraordinary and multi-talented person, and I hope we might talk about her at a future Monday Tea. Um, Michael, would you um, change the slide, please? Thank you. Here's a photo of the Robeson family in 1944, Paul, Islanda, and Paul Jr. And from around the same time, a photo of the Theater Guild production of Othello, with Robeson playing the lead, the title role, and German-American actress Uta Hagen playing Desdemona. It's worth noting that Robeson was the first African-American performer to play the role with an all-white supporting cast on Broadway. Paul Jr. told me that he had followed in his father's footsteps to Rutgers, and there, like his father, he became a football star. This was in the early 1940s, just around the time both of these photos were, photographs were taken. Paul Jr. told me that when his performances coincided with Rutgers football games, his father insisted that the game be played on a radio backstage. When either team scored, it was the responsibility of the next actor taking the stage to somehow convey the new score to Robeson mid-performance. And then that unlucky actor also had to somehow absorb Robeson's response, elation if the score favored Rutgers or disappointment if the challenging team had taken the lead. If you're like me, maybe this changes slightly the way you think about what may, ta what may be taking place between Uta Hagen and Paul Robeson in this photograph. Thank you, Michael. Okay, we close this evening with Richard Wright, best remembered as the author of the novel Native Son and the autobiography Black Boy, to which uh, both of which the adjective uh, searing is routinely applied. In the spirit of offering a deep cut, in Wright's own voice, and because most of his book length works are upwards of 500 pages, I wanted to read from articles that he wrote for the Daily Worker, the Communist Party organ, while employed there as a reporter in the late 1930s. Wright kept many of these articles in scrapbooks. Um, and can you go to the next slide, please, Michael? Uh, they, the scrapbooks are in his papers, and you can see a page of the, it here. Um, Though newspaper articles, the writing often seems characteristic to me of Wright's style more generally, especially in these early days of his career, in their blend of plain spokenness and lyricism. And so I'm gonna read two excerpts uh, diving right in. Uh, the first article ran August 12th, 1937 with the headline, Huddy Ledbetter, famous Negro folk artist sings the songs of Scottsboro and his people. When 50-year-old Huddy Ledbetter plunks himself in a chair, spreads his feet, and starts strumming his 12-string guitar and singing that rich, barrel-chested baritone, it seems that the entire folk culture of the American Negro has found its embodiment in him. Blues, spirituals, animal songs, ballads, and work songs pour forth in such profusion that it seems he knows every song his race has ever sung. Shaped and molded by some of the harshest social forces in American life, Ledbetter admits that he knows 500 folk songs, quote, and maybe many more I can't count, end quote. He makes his songs out of the day-to-day -day life of his people. He sings of death, of work, of balked love, of Southern jails no better than hell holes, of chain gangs, of segregation, and of his hope for a better life. This hard, stocky black man sang his way through the, through the Louisiana swamplands, the sun-baked cotton fields, and out of two state prisons where he was sent for protecting himself against the aggression of Southern whites. 
Down south, the white landlords called him bad and they were afraid of his fists, his bitter, biting songs, his 12 string guitar, and his inability to take in justice and like it. Because they feared him and respected his hardness, they called him Lead Belly. And at the first opportunity that came their way, they threw him in jail. The second article ran June 24th, 1938 with the headline, How He Did It, and oh, where were Hitler's pagan gods? He refers to Joe Lewis, who the day before had won his second prize fight matchup with Max Schmeling. I meant to check on the pronunciation of that. I'm not a boxing historian. Um, this is one of the most famous boxing matches of the decade, perhaps of all time. It is also one of Wright's longest daily worker pieces. And this excerpt is the conclusion. From the windows of high tenements, torn scraps of newspaper floated down. The mounted police were literally blotted out in a huge wave of exultant humanity. From midnight until dawn, it seemed that a million horns were ceaselessly blowing. Knowing full well the political effect of Joe's victory upon the popular mind of the world, thousands yelled, Heil Lewis! It was Harlem's mocking taunt to fascist Hitler's boast of the superiority of Aryans over other races. And Harlem ridiculed the Nazi salute of the outstretched palm by throwing up their own dark ones to show how little they feared and thought of, of the humbug of fascist ritual. What happened in Harlem Wednesday night marks in a certain sense the highest tide of popular political enthusiasm ever witnessed among American Negroes. The fascists, even though it was over a mere prize fight, had laid down a dare and Joe Lewis had answered it with his brawny fists. Harlem approved by reiterating a thousand times, say, ain't you glad? Can it be said too often that these popular demonstrations, no matter what their specific origin, contain within them seeds of glad tidings? The capacity of the people to respond with enthusiasm to what is their ultimate interest has yet to be plumbed to its depths. Thank you. <laughs>